a macabre experiment to bring a long dead franchise back to life, terminated before it could accomplish its horrible goal, a world dominated by monsters, only to return decades later kept alive in secret by a dedicated legion of acolytes. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of the Monster Squad. Thank you to 80stees.com for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code TOYGALAXY to get 30% off your order today. 80stees.com started off as the source for t-shirts inspired by all things pop culture from the 1980s, but there's more to the 80s than just the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 70s, the decade that paved the way for the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 90s, the decade that carried on the legacy of the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 2000s, because the 80s isn't just a decade, it's a state of mind. Whether your interests are laser-focused on one thing, say, movies, there's plenty of choices from Jaws to Shaun of the Dead. If your interests bounce around, they've got shirts from cartoons to video games, superheroes to music and wrestling. From Transformers to Dungeons and Dragons, Gollum to Ron Burgundy, Darkwing Duck to Powerpuff Girls, from Pong to Street Fighter 2. Their goal is to have something for everyone that loves retro pop culture. Whether your favorite cartoon is Gem and the Holograms or Robotech, or your favorite movie is The Karate Kid or Sixteen Candles, you'll find something you love. Click the link below and use code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order today. Again, that's code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order. Thanks again to 80stees.com. The Monster Squad is a 1987 movie directed by Fred Decker, written by Shane Black, skilled craftsman with the power and the tools to reignite declined interest in classic movie monsters. Despite Universal's attempt to put the kibosh on the project, Black and Decker delivered a film with heart that works without rigid devotion to the DeWalt, excuse me, default versions of the 50-year-old characters. The Monster Squad is a club founded by a group of kids living in small-town America just ambling through life, going to school, watching movies, riding bikes, and being utterly obsessed with monsters. They read about monsters, they talk about monsters, they write stories and draw pictures of monsters, they recognize metaphorical monsters in the faces of bullies and the authority figures that guide their days, but also believe in the existence of vampires and werewolves. Middle schooler Sean is the leader of the group, bolstered by his best friend Patrick and their mutual friend Horace. Elementary student Eugene is the youngest member, while Rudy, a tough and cool junior high school teenager is tested for acceptance. Sean's younger sister Phoebe, despite meeting all the other criteria for membership, remains on the outside thanks to the No Girls Allowed sign on the group's clubhouse. Sorry Phoebe, rules are rules. It's all just schoolyard clicks and posturing until one day Sean's mom gives him the diary of famed vampire hunter Abraham Van Helsing that she found at a yard sale. It tells the story of Van Helsing's fight against Dracula nearly a century ago and how close the world came to total destruction. Were it not for a magic amulet and Van Helsing's own fortitude, the monsters would have begun their conquest of evil. Instead, the monsters, Van Helsing and the amulet, have not been seen nor heard from until today. One hundred years to the day since his defeat, Dracula is putting his own monster squad together. Frankenstein's monster, the Wolfman, the Mummy, and a creature from a Black Lagoon assemble to find the amulet, avenge their master, and conquer the world anew. The Monster Squad was written by Fred Decker and Shane Black. The pair became friends while attending UCLA, Decker studying writing, Black training to be an actor. Decker found himself writing screenplays because, as he put it, they were easier and shorter to write than novels. In 1983, after graduating, the pair lived together in LA with a few other aspiring writers and actors in a house cramped with creativity. Decker was the first to find some success when he wrote a script for an unproduced Godzilla film called Godzilla, King of the Monsters in 3D. Black was trying his hand at screenwriting as well and wrote a script called Shadow Company, a movie about a group of Vietnam soldiers killed in action who come home and are reanimated as zombies. Despite being optioned by John Carpenter, Shadow Company was never produced. Decker, on the other hand, wrote a 15-page Twilight Zone-inspired story that formed the foundation for screenwriter Ethan Wiley to eventually turn into a full script for the 1986 movie House. In 1985, Decker and Black's partnership resulted in a concept that married the Little Rascals with the classic Universal Monsters, an homage to the kind of stuff they grew up watching. The stuff that got them interested in movies in the first place. Universal introduced the classic movie monsters in 1931 with Dracula and Frankenstein. The sequels began with Bride of Frankenstein in 1935 and Dracula's Daughter in 1936. 1941 introduced The Wolfman, which technically featured two wolfmen, the Biter and the Bitee. 
Decades before Marvel set the template for shared universes, Universal experimented with the power of a cinematic experience where all of their monsters coexisted. Either through creative inspiration or desperation, the degree of spectacle necessary to draw an audience inevitably resulted in an increasing number of monsters being featured in each successive production. It all came to a head in 1944's House of Frankenstein and 1945's House of Dracula, as Dracula, Frankenstein, and Wolfman executed in an Infinity War slash Endgame final chapter of the Golden Age of Universal Monsters, the monsters were officially a joke. Literal comedic punching bags starring in 1948's Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Nearly 40 years later, Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein is the film that Decker and Black credited as their inspiration. It established the original Monster Squad, the cadre of evil monsters led by Dracula, and set the template for the visual and thematic contrast of Abbott and Costello against the monsters. Furthermore, it depicted the monsters as real as possible with due respect to their heritage. Decker and Black had that same reverence in mind as they developed Monster Squad. In the early 80s, the Universal Monsters were practically non-existent. An entire generation knew them only as Halloween decorations or archetypes repurposed and reimagined in dozens of different ways for cartoons, in comic books, television, and in movies. The new movie monsters were Freddy Krueger and Jason, Michael Myers, The Thing, The Alien, The Fly, and Gremlins. Heck, to this generation of kids, every ghost monster and naked lady in Ghostbusters was scarier than the Universal monsters. As Decker moved on to his directorial debut with Night of the Creeps, Black wrote the Monster Squad script from the outline he and Decker had developed. That initial script was unfilmable. Too long, too big, too many effects, too expensive. Decker rewrote it into something a studio could actually produce. Got good news and bad news, girls. The good news is your dates are here. What's the bad news? They're dead. Once finished, they offered it to Universal, the inspiration for the entire thing in the first place, teed up for them to introduce the monsters to a whole new generation in a Goonies meets Ghostbusters family comedy with enough edge to appeal to kids who were used to sneaking into really scary movies. Universal passed. Thankfully, Peter Hyams, a more experienced director than Decker, with a lot more connections and pull in the industry, liked the project and agreed to come on board as an executive producer. While Shane Black stepped away to write Lethal Weapon and Star in Predator, both released in 1987. Without Universal support, the Monster Squad production was in a tight spot. How do you create monsters that are similar to, but legally distinct from, the Universal monsters when recognition and the power of nostalgia are an integral part of the story? Well, you ask Stan Winston Studios to do it for you. How did Stan Winston Studios do it? Once they knew they couldn't directly recreate the monsters from the original films, they worked on updating them from the 30s to the 80s, treating them like friends you haven't seen in a while, but would still recognize with a different haircut, a new wardrobe, or a few more fangs in their mouth. What seemed like a production obstacle was actually an unexpected degree of creative freedom. The new monster design started with sketches from Stan Winston himself. Tom Woodruff Jr., who would ultimately perform as the Gilman creature in the film, led the team taking on Frankenstein's monster. Stan Winston Studios produced characters that were exactly what the movie needed. Fresh, modern versions of stale characters that audiences could both connect to and be terrified by. Monsters that this generation of moviegoers could claim as their own. Some of the work was so revolutionary that it found its way into other productions. When the team working on Predator was having problems with the creation of their own monster, it was innovations developed on the Stan Winston Studios Gilman suit that saved the day. Once upon a time, it was one monster per movie. Those were the good old days. We're the Monster Squad. The Monster Squad, rated PG-13. The cast of the Monster Squad was half kids, half monsters. Andre Gower as Sean, Ashley Bank as his younger sister Phoebe, Robbie Kiger as Patrick, Ryan Lambert as Rudy, Michael Faustino as Eugene, and Brent Chalum as Horace. Tom Noonan, fresh off 1986's Manhunter, took on the role of Frankenstein's monster. Duncan Regeer played Dracula. Carl Tebow played the Wolfman. Michael McKay was the mummy thanks to his rail-thin physique. And of course, Tom Woodruff as Gilman. The rest of the cast featured character actors that you probably recognize from something. Stephen Mock played Sean's dad, Detective Del Crenshaw. Sean's mom was played by Mary Ellen Trainer, who had previously been in The Goonies and Lethal Weapon. And Leonardo Semino was cast as Scary German Guy. 
Dustin Diamond and Liam Neeson were both in scenes that were ultimately cut from the film, as executive producer Peter Hyams really wanted runtime to be under 90 minutes. Diamond was a kid at Sean and Patrick's school. Neeson was doubling as a disguised Dracula instead of putting heavy makeup on Regeer. Shooting began in October of 1986 with all the restrictions that come with having your principal actors under the age of 18. The law limits the amount of time they can actually work on the set and at what times of day. On top of that, director Fred Decker and executive producer Peter Himes frequently clashed due to differences in their filmmaking process. Decker has admitted that he was surprised he didn't get fired during the first week of filming. As Decker told the story, he was a young director essentially shooting for the final edit. He knew what shots he needed. Hyams was a wizened professional who wanted Decker to follow a more traditional method that utilized a master shot before anything else in the scene was shot. Not because Hyams was a stickler for the old ways, but because that was a tried and true method of making sure everyone on set knew what the scene was, what they needed to do, and to make sure you had enough coverage when it came time to edit. If you miss something, if something was wrong with a shot that you didn't catch on set and you need to cut around it, you can always cut back to the master. If you have a master, that's filmmaking 101, baby. <laughs> With a budget estimated around $13 million, Monster Squad opened in the U.S. in August of 1987, and like the monsters themselves, it was dead on arrival. Decker and some of the cast toured theaters in the L.A. area on opening night and were stunned to see as little as seven or eight people in attendance. It made less than $3 million in its opening week. Its second week added another $900,000. It wasn't long before it was pulled from theaters, taking a substantial loss, leaving everyone involved defeated, and some hoping that if no one ever saw it, they would never have to be embarrassed by being associated with it. There was plenty of blame to go around for the movie's failure at the box office. Decker thought the distributor TriStar Pictures could have done a better job selling the film for what it was. Their marketing campaign made it seem like it was a cartoon about catching monsters. The PG-13 rating, newly introduced just three years prior in 1984, meant that the audience, who most likely would have enjoyed it, were deterred from seeing it. Parents didn't want another Gremlins in the Microwave incident. They didn't want to sit through the extraction of a still-beating heart from a person's chest... again. On the other hand, kids older than 13 were more likely sneaking into The Lost Boys, a much more provocative vampire story, rated R for really shouldn't have watched that as a 14-year-old. Most of the reviews were uncomfortably unkind, with the New York Times calling it, quote, a feature-length commercial for a joke store that sells not-great rubber monster masks, end quote. The Chicago Tribune piled on, calling it, quote, part E.T. and part Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, the monster squad is crass but imponderable, bizarrely mixing glowingly backlit sentimentality with stomach-churning violence and juvenile sex jokes. Its target audience appears to be practice sadists in the 12 to 14-year-old age group, end quote. But here's the thing. This movie wasn't made for the critics. To this day, Fred Decker says it's the best thing he ever made, and he means it. And the kids that might have seen it in theaters, were it not for all the extenuating circumstances, did eventually see it. And it connected. Most movies are intended by their creators to be experienced in a communal setting, in a theater with an audience, experiencing the big screen spectacle together. But no artist has control over their creation once it's finished and released into the world. It takes on its own life, and the audience will appreciate it or not on their own terms. The Monster Squad found its audience despite its devastating performance in theaters. For the next 20 years, the kids of the 80s watched it repeatedly on HBO, where there was no enforcement mechanism for the PG-13 rating. It was released on VHS, Beta, and Laserdisc, making it accessible as word spread from neighborhood to neighborhood and across the schoolyard about this unknown gem. The only movie with the guts to address the burning questions like, does the Wolfman have nards? It was technology that not only helped to foster a community around the Monster Squad, but revealed that it had been there all along. People around the world connected with Monster Squad quietly, privately, in their own ways, to the humor, to the characters, to the visual effects, to the dialogue. They saw themselves and their own experiences and the kids on screen and imagined themselves just one step away from being part of that monster squad. Not necessarily as monster hunters, but as friends in a place where they belonged. The internet revealed that community and gave them the strength to lobby together as one entity. Come on, don't be chicken shit. That lobbying effort was led by Eric Vespi in 2006, a writer for Ain't It Cool News and movie fan in general. It was his mission to find a way to bring Monster Squad back into the popular consciousness to give it its due reverence, to bring together this community of fans and get this movie screened, and more importantly, released on DVD. And also Night of the Creeps while you're at it. 
Vespi reached out to Tim League, the CEO of the Alamo Draft House in Texas, to set up a screening of the Monster Squad. After acquiring what was thought to be the only copy of the film on 35mm in existence, they invited writer-director Fred Decker and stars Andre Gower, Ashley Bank, and Ryan Lambert. The first screening sold out so fast, a second screening was added, which also sold out so fast. The screenings kicked off a revival for the film with a fan base that was already primed for the job. The most commonly asked question, what do we have to do to get it on DVD? Decker himself helped with the letter writing campaign to get the rights holders to understand that there was money to be made. In 2007, Lionsgate released a two disc set with a bunch of bonus features, including a documentary, multiple audio commentaries, trailers, and storyboards. More importantly, the revival campaign let the cast and crew put their minds at ease. After two decades of believing that their movie was an abject failure creatively and financially, they were smothered with validation. A year later, in 2008, Monster Squad co-executive producer Rob Cohen announced that Paramount was actively producing a remake, but they were still seeking a director. In 2010, Platinum Dunes Michael Bay's production company signed on. Rob Cohen was announced as director, with Mark and Brian Gunn as writers. By 2014, the remake was dead. In 2018, Wolfman's Got Nards premiered at the Chattanooga Film Festival. It's a feature-length documentary directed by Andre Gower, who starred as Sean in the original film. It's the story of the film's creation, its infamy, and its legacy told by the people who made it and the people who fell in love with it over the years. And like two weeks ago, Kino Lorber announced that they're releasing The Monster Squad on glorious 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray. Created from the original 35mm print, pre-orders are live as of this video, and the three-disc set is scheduled to hit at the end of November. This year, 2023, it includes Gower's Wolfman's Got Nards. The new 4K release also corrects an egregious omission from the original movie poster. Sean's younger sister Phoebe is finally given her due respect as a full member, added to the team photo with the rest of the Monster Squad. The Monster Squad connected with its audience one person at a time because it treated both the kids and the monsters like they were real. The kids in the movie acted and sounded like real kids with real, relatable problems. Parents on the verge of divorce, pressure from teachers, the burden of schoolwork, the daily anxiety of just trying to fit in with the other kids when you don't feel like there's anyone in the world quite as weird as you. The Monster Squad invited them, you, the audience, anyone who could identify with that feeling of being different to join them. Because the only qualification for membership was that you like monsters. You didn't even have to pass the test because the test isn't real. Kids saw themselves in Sean and Patrick and Phoebe and Rudy and Horace, empowered to not just protect themselves, but to have their voices validated and believed. And not for nothing, but to use that new power to save the world by defeating the most infamous monsters in history. Those empowered kids became adults who fought to make sure that this movie and that experience was both accessible and preserved for themselves and future generations. They saved this movie because everyone who asked, am I the only one who remembers this, was able to connect with every other person asking them themselves that same question. Like the original Universal Monsters who inspired it, the Monster Squad was dangerous and scary for an audience still too ignorant to know what's real and what isn't. An audience that doesn't think about how movies are made, they only know how they make them feel. It was a movie that looked like it was about the monsters, but was actually about the squad. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free, as well as behind the scenes features, sneak peeks at upcoming projects, an exclusive monthly podcast about the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. And let us know in the comments down below if you actually saw Monster Squad in theaters or if you discovered it in the years that followed. I have a vague memory of its existence, but looking back, I'm not totally sure I knew about it from commercials when it originally was released. I definitely didn't see it in theaters, but I definitely also didn't see it until maybe the early 2000s, but I distinctly remember knowing about the Wolfman's Got Nards line, so maybe someone in one of my classes told the rest of us about it, question mark, <laughs> or maybe I saw it on HBO. It's one of those things that's just always been there, but I can't honestly nail down when I watched it. All that said, I forgot there was a rap at the end of the movie, and you better cut the camera right now. Save yourself. Save the show. I'm going to rap. <laughs> In a hundred years, in the darkest night, the forces of evil come out to fight the amulet they must destroy or spend forever.